Okay, so in our last section of notes, we talked about the formal amendment process and the way in which the Constitution can be um, amended formally. And so in this section of notes, we're going to be talking about um, the five informal methods of change or the five ways in which the Constitution can be um, altered without actually changing the wording of the Constitution. So firstly, um, it's important that you understand that there is um, a great deal of the Constitution that cannot be seen with the naked eye. Much has been put there, not by formal amendment, but rather by the day-to-day -day or year-to-year -year experiences of government under the Constitution. Many changes have occurred that have not involved any changes in its written words. And this continues uh, to occur in five basic ways. Um, with the passage of basic legislation, actions taken by uh, the president, key decisions of the Supreme Court, um, the activities of political parties, and lastly, custom um, or tradition. Okay, so basic legislation. Um, Congress has altered or spelled out the meaning of much of the Constitution through two methods. Um, first, by passing laws to spell out the constitutional's or Constitution's meaning. Um, one example would be um, setting up the court system, presidential succession, who would become president if something were to happen to the president, uh, creation of positions within the executive branch. Um, so specifically, um, Article 3, Section 1 of the Constitution holds that there will be one Supreme Court um, and such inferior forts, uh, courts that Congress may establish. Um, the Judicial Act of 1789 says that all federal courts have been set up by acts of Congress. And then Article 2 creates only the offices of the president and vice president, um, that other department agencies and offices in the now huge executive branch have been created by acts of Congress. So again, these are all examples um, in which Congress has um, shown its power, uh, specifically um, in setting up uh, the court system and then also um, setting up the cabinet, okay, or the other departments, agencies, and offices um, in within the executive branch. Um, the second here is exercising their power, or the way in which Congress exercises their power. So some examples of this would be to regulate interstate trade um, and also end segregation through this power. So in the Constitution, one of the powers that Congress is given is to regulate interstate trade. And that's pretty broad. And so we have to figure out what that actually means. And um, our government allows Congress to um, define the meaning. Um, so this would be considered an express power. And these are powers granted um, to Congress. Um, and that, again, is to regulate foreign and interstate trade as well as what uh, that really means and what powers they have as far as regulating that trade is completely left up to Congress to interpret. So the second method of informal change would be executive actions or actions taken by the president. So this would again be the use of presidential powers to impact the Constitution. Um, some examples here. Congress is the only branch that can declare war, but the president is the commander-in-chief. Um, though this, many presidents have made, through this, many presidents have made war without an official declaration of war hundreds of times. Um, and so, again, Congress is the only one that can declare war. However, um, a president can um, take an action that could lead to war. Um, so one example would be when President Bush sent troops to Iraq. Okay, so no, he wasn't declaring war per se, um, but he was definitely um, getting a war started. An second example here would be an executive agreement versus a treaty. So Congress is the only one that has the ability to form a treaty with a foreign power. However, the president can form executive agreements with other countries. Um, and so the difference here is an executive agreement is a pact made by the president directly with the head of a foreign state. 
Um, and a treaty then is a formal agreement between two or more sovereign states. Now with a treaty, uh, according to Act Article 11, Section 1, uh, you have to, um, it has to be approved by Congress, where with an executive agreement, it doesn't. And so again, this is a way in which a president can um, make a, um, a uh, what's the word I'm looking for? An alliance uh, with a, another country uh, informally. Um, so presidents have signed executive agreements with leaders of other countries, and these do not need Senate approval like a former treaty does. All right, so court decisions. Um, the Supreme Court interprets the Constitution. Uh, so some examples here would be Mulberry versus Madison. This gave the court the power of judicial review, and judicial review just gives uh, the Supreme Court the power to decide if a um, action or law is constitutional or unconstitutional. Um, if it goes against the Constitution or if it um, does not. The Supreme Court is a constitutional convention in continuous session. So if you remember back, the Constitutional Convention, they first met to make improvements to the Articles of Confederation. However, they ended up drafting the Constitution and replacing uh, the Articles of Confederation with the Constitution. Therefore, the ongoing changes made to the Constitution could be considered on an ongoing constitutional convention that is in the hands then of uh, the Supreme Court. Um, because again, they are the ones that interpret the Constitution, interpret the meaning of the Constitution, and interpret if um, an action um, taken is going against that Constitution, against that document, um, and what it states. In Marbury versus Madison, which was uh, a case in 1803, uh, this was a landmark United States Supreme Court case in which the court formed the basis for the exercise of judicial review in the United States under Article 3 of the Constitution. All right, party practices. Um, political parties have been a major source of constitutional change, despite not being mentioned anywhere in the Constitution. Um, and even some of the framers were completely against the formation of political parties. Um, so we're currently a two-party system, uh, Republican and Democratic. Um, some examples here of party practices. Neither the Constitution nor any law set up the nomination process for presidential candidates. Political parties do. Um, lots of things in D.C. are based on parties. So Congress is organized based on parties. Again, Democratic or Republican. Uh, and then a few independents. I think just one. Um, appointments to office are based on party affiliation. Um, so from the 1830s on, major parties have held uh, national conven conventions. Um, the parties have uh, converted the Electoral College, the group that makes the formal selection of the nation's president, from what the framers intended, into a rubber stamp uh, for each of the state's popular vote in presidential elections. And so this basically here is just saying that um, you know, since the 1830s, major parties have selected presidential candidates at national conventions. Um, and then the group of people who actually f chooses our president, which is the um, Electoral College, um, they um, th their job has kind of been altered. So the framers intended for their job to be um, to obviously choose the president, but... Um, they felt like it should not be so clear who they are going to choose. Um, where today, uh, what we often see happen is the um, candidates, or I'm sorry, the delegates of the Electoral College, choose who the majority of the people chose in that state, or the popular vote. Um, and that's our vote. They typically uh, vote in the same manner. And so it's normally not shocking uh, when we, we see the results from state to state. Okay, the last um, of the informal methods would be the unwritten custom um, or unwritten tradition. Uh, for example, the head of the 15 executive departments make up the president's cabinet. Um, this is just custom. This is something that um, has always been in place. Um, another example would be senatorial courtesy. The Senate will not approve a presidential appointee opposed 
by a majority party senator from the state in which the appointee would serve. Um, <clears throat> and then third, before FDR, presidents served only two terms, just traditionally. Um, and then when FDR came along, he served four terms. And after this, the 22nd Amendment was put in place um, in 1951 and made it a written rule within the Constitution um, that you could only serve, uh, as president, you could only serve two terms. So with the senatorial uh, courtesy, um, again, it's an unwritten rule that was intended to shift a portion of the appointing power from the president, uh, where the formal constitution puts it, to certain members of Congress. Um, maybe a way in which to kind of check um, the presidential power with the legislative power. Um, also understand that with the 25th Amendment, um, provided that the vice president will replace the president if he or she dies in office. The Constitution did not provide this action until the 25th Amendment. And in fact, in the Constitution, it said that the powers and duties of the presidency, but not the office itself, should be transferred to the VP. Okay, and so with the addition of the 25th Amendment, which would be a formal amendment, um, this was not um, as clear as it is today. <clears throat> 